Hello, my name is Kevin Howard, and this is Patrick Lovell's Truth Bombs. Today, I would like to talk to you about a word we all know, but hardly think about too much. The word is con, C-O-N. Con is short for confidence game. So what's a confidence game, right? A confidence game occurs where I offer you a story, a narrative, and that narrative gains your confidence sufficiently to get you to give me some money. The crux of the con is that the story that convinced you to give me your confidence and ultimately your money turns out to be untrue. And you don't get back what you expected. That's why it's a con, a confidence game. And so, so much of what afflicts our lives as Americans is that we are immersed in systemic confidence games. So, whether you're talking about our politics, whether you're talking about our media, whether you're talking about how products and services are sold to us, it's become the ultimate con. And uh, so I'm gonna sp I want to speak a little bit about each of those categories so that we can get to the 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 trend line in between that connects all of them. Okay, and that's what this that's what this truth bomb is going to be about. So bear with me. This is my first one for Patrick. So uh, so let's start with let's start with the politics and and the con that our major political parties have played on America for the last fifty years. Now I'm not going to get into all the examples in this truth bomb, but let's start with the Democrats. So. Once, so here, as we enter a presidential election season, the Democrats are saying what? You got to vote for the president, President Biden, because you have to save democracy from Donald Trump. But the way the Democrats are going about nominating President Biden is by literally destroying democracy. And how are they doing that? So the Democratic National Party decided, how can I fix the primary season to make sure that no one could, that no one could successfully challenge the president? Well, the first move they went and did was they, they moved the South Carolina primary to be the first primary after the Iowa caucus. Now, the New Hampshire primary historically has been the first Democratic primary. So much so that the state of New Hampshire added their first primary status into their state constitution. So the hubris of the Democratic Party and the intention to rig the primary season on behalf of President Biden was that they, that they failed to check and take note that not only is the, the, the first primary guaranteed in the New Hampshire Constitution, but that at the time that the Democratic Party was intending to push New, uh, South Carolina in for, in, to be the first primary, they failed to notice that in New Hampshire, Republicans had the governor's seat and the majority of the legislature. So therefore, in, or even if New, the, the New Hampshire Democrats wanted to comply with the request of, of the Democratic Party, of the National Party. They couldn't because they relied on, they would have to get permission from the Republicans to change the New Hampshire Constitution. And why? In order to rig an election for Joe Biden? No, thank you. So therefore, New Hampshire could not comply. The New Hampshire Democrats could not comply. And so they held their primary anyway. And what does the Democrats do? You know, the ones who are protecting democracy? They disenfranchise. They, they say the votes of the people of, of the Democrats of New Hampshire do not count. 
their delegates do not count. Welcome to democracy. Uh, little, you know, small letter democracy under the Democratic Party. Okay. They have also pressured various states. The National Democratic Party are pressuring state uh, Democratic parties to cancel their primaries and give their delegates to President Biden. Now, this is notwithstanding that he actually has challenges in the Democratic Party for, you know, for, you know, for the nomination of the party. And so far, the state of Florida has actually done it. One of the biggest primary states in the country has actually canceled their primary and given all their delegates to President Joe Biden. So here's the con. Vote Democrats to save democracy as long as you can accept the fact that what you're going to get is the party who has put forward the first sham presidential primary season in U.S. history. Okay, so that's the Democrats. How about the Republicans? Well, how about Trump? Okay, so so Trump, it's, it's kind of interesting. Trump is, he is so masterful at what he does well. And what he does well is he sells himself. He sells himself, he understands his customers. So when, when Trump, when President Trump, former President Trump, Donald Trump, ran, you know, for the, pre for the presidency in 2016, his, his read of the electorate was spot on. What he saw was an electorate that had been, that had been betrayed so often. And we're talking about a Republican electorate and a Democratic electorate that have been, been, been betrayed so often by their own parties, by their own elected officials, that, the, that most people had contempt for the establishment. So what <laughs> part of Trump's marketing strategy to appeal to an electorate that was pissed off at the establishment parties is to break Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment. Basically, you never trash a fellow Republican. Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump, framed who he was as a Republican candidate for the president as an anti-establishment politician, or anti-establishment businessman, how about that, by eviscerating George W. Bush for his failed foreign policy debacle in Iraq. Now, we, we all know that that's true, but no Republican was, was ever holding him to account for that until Donald Trump comes along and completely eviscerates him on that point, right? This sent a signal to the electorate, particularly the Republican electorate, that, did, that Donald Trump has as much contempt for the Republican establishment as they do. Oh, that was a marriage made in heaven. These were people ready to walk through fire and are still willing to walk through fire for Donald Trump on that basis alone, right? And so he has successfully framed himself as, as an anti-establishment, right, um, businessman running for the presidency. But then what do you get back? Now, okay, that's fine. That's fine. You elected him and many working class, middle class people elected Donald Trump, right? Because we know where the moneyed classes are. They're in the Republican establishment. So working class people, middle class people who have been portrayed by their own party over and over again, right, elect Donald Trump because he's willing to absolutely call the establishment out for what they are, right? Con men, right? But then what does he deliver? He delivers two pieces of major legislation. The 2017 tax cuts, right, corporate tax cuts, and he delivers the CARES Act, you know, in March of 2020, you know, to, in response to COVID. This is how we're going to help folks get through sheltering and in place, shutting down the economy, figuring out, you know, how to deal with a pandemic, you know, funding you know, research or, you know, or the development of a vaccine in the fastest period of time in U.S. history, all that stuff is rolled into the CARES Act. Okay, great. 
But when you look at those two pieces of legislation and you look at who it helped, who really got the help, right? <laughs> well, okay, for the tax cuts, and it was a bunch of tax cuts. It was not just reducing the corporate, the, the, the corporation, the corporate tax rate, right? It was also reducing the you know, um, personal tax uh, rates, particularly at the highest level. It was also reducing, you know, cutting by 20%. You know, the pass through, the tax on pass through um, income, you know, corporate pass, like S Corp income, right? So, all these things that people who, who, who make real money, you know, get benefit. Okay. So, an analysis was done on the 2017 tax cut. <laughs> and, and the average person in the top 1% got like $60,000 each. And the middle class, the median person, <laughs> the bulk of the country, right? And they got less than a thousand dollars. I think, in fact, I think it was like six hundred dollars. It was ridiculous, right? Okay, so that's a 2017 tax cut. The CARES Act, okay. The pandemic unemployment insurance, six hundred dollars a week, right? You know, a boon to working class people who who lost jobs and stuff like that. Okay, all right. One that expired by the end of July of 2020. Okay, then PPP for small businesses isn't that wonderful? We're gonna do 300 billion dollars, 320 billion dollars to, to, to make money available for small businesses. Okay, all this is in the CARES Act, CARES Act. but we also are gonna allocate, we're also gonna allocate. $500 billion to large corporations with over 500 employees. And of that $500 billion, the CARES Act designated $75 billion for uh, the airline industry and for the um, cruise line industry, which leaves $425 billion for, the large, for, for, for these large corporations. And so... What, what does the Treasury Department do with these allocations, the $325 billion for the PPP and, and, and the $425 billion for these large corporations? Okay, the $325 billion is administered by the Small Business Administration, and it becomes the pool of funds to loan out. The $425 billion gets issued out to the Federal Reserve who uses the $425 billion as a loss, re loss reserve for a loan program, a virtual zero-interest loan program that is 10 times that size to those corporations. And that $425 billion became like the loss reserve. So to the extent that the businesses didn't pay back their 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 zero coupon loan, or let's say 25 basis point loan, right? There was a loss reserve there to cover that, right? And you would think at that interest rate, the businesses would be able to pay, most of them will pay back that loan at that interest rate. So therefore the loss reserve is not even gonna be fully utilized. But what it did was, it is it allowed the Federal Reserve to flood $4.25 trillion into, you know, into the largest corporations in this country. Right. And to know the effects of what I'm speaking about, the effects of the CARES Act, by the end of 2020, you, you, you find the tale of two countries. Right. So what happened to working people? If you make less than twenty six thousand dollars a year. Right. OK. You by the end of 2020, you lost 10 million jobs. By the end of 2020, if you made over $60,000 a year, unemployment was at pre-COVID levels. In other words, you fully recovered. If you were a small business in America start at the start of 2020, by the end of 2020, 30% of all small businesses in America closed and never reopened. But how did, how did, how did, the same class of citizens that Donald Trump is in. Donald Trump is a billionaire. So how did the billionaires do? <laughs> right? Oh my God. 
the billionaire and the American billionaires, their net worth went up over a trillion dollars. Think about that, right? Main Street productivity, GDP contracted 3.5% in 2020. 3.5%. Doesn't sound like much. It was twice as much as the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, and by far the greatest contraction since the 1930s during the Great Depression. Okay, that was Main Street, real economy. Okay, the four trillion dollars that the Federal Reserve gave to these corporations by buying their their, their by, by floating them, right, translated into a stock market boom. So the S and P 500. Real economy, GDP goes down 3.5%. S&P 500 by the end of 2020 went up 16%. And if that's not broad enough, the Russell 2000, now that, okay, went up 18%. And the NASDAQ composite technology went up 43.6%. Hmm. So working people lose 10 million jobs. 30% of all small businesses in the country go bankrupt and never open up again. You know, close and never open up again, right? Billionaires gain a trillion dollars in net worth. And the, the businesses are doing so well that Wall Street has one of the greatest years they've ever had while the real economy is contracting greater than it ever contracted in U.S. history. Don't believe me? Go ahead and Google the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, and 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 you will you will see the Federal Reserve keeps their keeps their record. You will see that the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve was five trillion dollars. You know, you know, and, and pre COVID started in twenty twenty, and it peaked peaked in twenty twenty one because it was it took them some time to dist distribute four trillion dollars. At nine trillion dollars <laughs> into 2021. I mean, you would think I had to make this stuff up. Okay. So the net effect of Trump, yeah, he told he he, he told a good story. He, 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 he gained our confidence. He told us that he was going to clean the swamp. He told us that he was going to, to he eviscerated, he hated the establishment. He also he, he eviscerated the, the establishment Democrats, Clinton and Obama, for how they sold out their electorate. Yeah, he was great at telling that story. But when it came down to what you got in return, okay, I, and I'm assuming as a working person, I'm assuming that you were hoping that you were going to get a better job out of it. I'm assuming that you were hoping your economics was going to materially improve, right? But as I told you, there's only two major things that Trump, in terms of legislation that was passed under the Trump administration, the 2017, you know, tax cuts, right, and 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 the and the in the CARES Act, right, and I can tell you, almost all the benefit went to the billionaire class, right? Almost all the benefit went to the top one percent. Don't believe me? Google it. Check it out yourself. So, so this is a part of the con, right? So that's the political con. Right? The media, oh my God. Now, in the real world where you and I live, we know whether you've raised kids or not, you know, whether you, however you solve problems, the truth about anything is rarely told from one side and one point of view. Right? So if you if you only are getting one side of the story, you rarely know the truth of what actually happened. It's, I mean, if that, that's been my experience, I'm speaking to our shared experience. So I'm gonna take that I'm gonna take this as a given that you you've experienced that too. Okay. But how is the media organized? To the right, you got Fox News. To the left, you got CNN and MSNBC. There is no real medium, right? Middle, right? You know, in establishment media. And it's done that way on purpose. So Fox will tell you all the, the, the story 
is completely from a conservative perspective so that you can decide what's true, okay? MSNBC, CNN, you know, um, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you know, not Wall Street Journal, that's conservative, right? Um, Washington Post, all, you know, they tell you from the progressive side. Everything from the progressive side. Okay. Even if you were studious enough every night to watch Fox News and MSNBC, you would, you figure, okay, now I'm getting both sides of the story. You would, you would not have any idea of what actually happened. Why? Because they're so focused on telling one side of the story and telling it in the way that will get the audience who's watching them completely pissed off at the other side of the story. Why? So that we could fight. So that we could see two totally different worlds. Right? And and that's what we have. Look, look around the country. This <laughs> this is the this is the 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 the, the divided states of America. Is, is more divided than ever in U.S. history, right? Why? Because our sources of establishment, mainstream information, totally polarize, only giving one point of view, eviscerating the other point of view. And that's all that's out there. And therefore, okay, so, so whether you're a conservative or whether you're progressive, right, you're getting a, a story that you want to hear, that you're inclined to believe, you know, that's the narrative, right? But it ain't the truth. It's back to the con. It's back to the con. It's the confidence game. Why? Because when you believe the story that Fox has given you, you're going to go out and support candidates who, who trumpet and represent that view of the world. And you do. Same thing with the MSNBC, CNN, New York Times crowd, NPR crowd. They they. They're given a story that they are inclined to believe anyway, right? And they go out and they support people who who mirror that, that, that view of the world, right? Which is why they do it. All the while having no understanding for how anyone can go the other way. So we have this, the, the vitriol in our country is at an all-time high, okay? But are we left with knowing the truth? So let's test the metal. Let's test the metal of the stories that we've been told. Okay, I'm going to rely on things that we all have gone through, right? And I'm going to preface that by saying, how many times do we do they have to lie to us for us to realize they're lying to us? Okay. All right. The the current stories we have. That have that are facing the country. Let's say the take the war in Ukraine. Okay, so what have we been told? We've been told that Russia engaged in in um, they attacked Ukraine for no good reason other than Putin has has a vision of, of creating the greater Russia. And oh my God, if you say anything that he would say, anything in his defense, you are branded an apologist for him, right? So you only get one side of the story. In comes Zelensky. In comes the Ukrainian side of the story. In comes, you know, this is the latest version of the Freedom Fighters. How many times have we heard this before? But okay, but here this is the latest version. So basically, Russia, for no good reason, has decided pure adventurism to attack Ukraine. And, and we must take billions of dollars. Billions. I mean, how, are we over $100 billion by now? Right? I mean, billions of dollars to maintain and support not only the Ukrainian military, but Ukrainian society. I mean, <laughs> we're, paying, we're, we're, pay, we're, we're paying people salaries in Ukraine. Okay. All right. No 
problem? Okay. Because we're defending freedom. We're defending democracy, right? And 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 Putin, who's a, clearly the next, you know, what Hitler, right? He's he, right. Is he must be stopped at any cost? And 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 to do that, we have been a part, as in the United States, has led the international community to give to give Russia the death penalty, the economic death penalty. We seized their international dollar-denominated reserves. Trillions, right? We, we seized it, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, or certainly hundreds of billions. We banned global trade to Russia. We cut their central bank off <laughs> from the international system, okay? Because of what they did in Ukraine. And the reason why is because it was just a naked aggression that must be stopped. That's that's the prevailing narrative. Okay. Now, have we heard anything? We, 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 we just heard from Putin the first time because Tucker Carlson interviewed him for two hours. We get to that. Have we, have we been told the Russian point of view? In a way that you know, or, or, or we, or we do we give any credibility to anything we've heard about the Russian point of view? No. <laughs> Again, anyone, anyone who said who tries to explain why Russia would do what they did, what what, what why Russia would attack Ukraine, is branded a Putin apologist. And, and such and all such you know you know critiques like that okay but what does your personal experience tell you is anything just one side of the story and that that's the absolute truth right well let's penetrate past the narrative the story that we've been told because I I, I hope I've established the pattern of the con you always get the story from one perspective right? But it never turns out to be true. Okay, well, here we go. Okay. Some of this I know must have been seeping in from different sources who were scandalized for saying these things. But I want you for a second to put yourself in position of the very people we are convinced to hate. So put yourself in position of Russia. Hard to do, but but if you're interested in understanding the truth and you look in your own life and you know the truth is 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 never found just from one point of view. <laughs> you need perspective to get a sense of what's true. Okay, so let's 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 look to see if we can validate anything from outside of the narrative that we've been told to explain why Russia did this, right? Because we give we are not giving any credible reason. Other than the, just adventurism, they're just expansionists. <laughs> okay, okay. So here we are. It's a matter of public record that the Soviet Union, USSR, because this is where the story goes back to, and it goes back well beyond that. But for the sake of our conversation, let's put it back. Let's go back to 1991, when the Soviet Union was had a choice. Gorbachev had a choice. Reagan was successful in, in, in building up the U.S. military. And I happened to have the pleasure of serving in, in NATO at the peak of the Cold War during the Reagan administration. He put the death knell in the, in, in, in the, in the, the Cold War by, by putting M1 tanks and M2 Abrams across Europe and demonstrating that, that America will not lose the technological race. And, and we will continue to invest enormous resource in, the, in, in, in perfecting our military. So, so by conventional means, Russia started to realize, the Soviet Union started to realize they couldn't win this war. Now they had nuclear weapons and that was their, that was their holding card, as we did, you know, mutual, mutually assured destruction, right? So they literally had a choice. It wasn't a good choice, 
But the question is, they didn't have to just go down, right? The, the, the choice is, is well, we're, we're either going to blow up the world with you or we're going we're gonna to negotiate some sort of reasonable way that we can transition. And Gorbachev ende- endeavored to negotiate some reasonable way that they could transition, which I, I assume everyone watching this would agree that was the choice that America would want. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so they, cut, they made a deal. Gorbachev and Yeltsin made a deal, made deals with a President H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. That, okay. They're going to wind down and dismantle the Soviet Empire, all their satellite states, including all of Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact. They're going to relinquish control of all these countries that they control. They're going to pull their nuclear weapons back to Russia. Okay. Further, they agree that they will support the reunification of Germany. And the reunified Germany, they will support that reunified country joining NATO. Okay. Now, I want to just take a moment to to just explain how significant this is. Russia lost over 20 million Russians at the hands of the Germans in World War II. (laughs) Okay. Right. America has no idea what that level of sacrifice is. We've never sacrificed that much. We're still licking our wounds over 600,000 in Vietnam. So let's, let's just be real. 20 million, over 20 million, maybe 27 million, up to 20 million, over 20 million people. Okay. So when, when the Soviet Union agreed to the reunification of Germany, right? <laughs> right, right, and they could join NATO, a force that has been in opposition to them for, since World War II, it was a major concession. Okay, so what did they ask in return? Because again, they got nukes. They they're not going down that way, right? They they're, they're gonna you know we want to do this right. We want to do this peacefully, but we're not gonna lay on our back. <laughs> okay, Papa Bush and Bill Clinton gave our the United States gave them a private assurance that if they agreed and they did all that, NATO would not move one inch east of Germany. Okay. Now, much has been poo-pooed about this private assurance. As if Russia and the former Soviet Union were foolish to not get it in writing. I want to remind you of something. Okay. In 1962, we had an event that, that, that most of us have studied in school. I wasn't alive either, called the Cuban Missile Crisis. (laughs) Okay, okay. And and what had happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis? The former Soviet Union, at the height of the Cold War, put intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons, in Cuba. Okay. And when the United States discovered that the, the Soviet Union had done that, the United States pushed us to world, almost to World War III over this issue. There was no way the United States, under the Kennedy administration, was going to allow the Soviet Union to keep intercontinental ballistic missiles in Cuba, sufficient to hit every city in the United States, including Seattle. Okay? All right. Now, okay, how did we solve that problem? It's the closest we've come, known case that we've come to World War III in American history. Now, there are other cases that are less known that, that, that were close. I mean, you know, we won't have to digress into those. But the, the known case that came the closest to World War III was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So how did they solve the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis? Um, you wouldn't believe it. A private assurance. So at the height of the Cold War, with, with two nuclear powers about to go, go to blows, right? <laughs> President Kennedy gave a private assurance to Premier Khrushchev. And that private assurance was, okay, if, you, if, Russia, if the USSR remove their nuclear weapons out of Cuba, 
right? The United States would promise never to attack Cuba, never to attack Cuba. And six months later, six months later, very secretly, very quietly, the United States would remove their nuclear missiles out of Turkey. Side note, we put them in Turkey in the 50s. So let's, let's don't get it twisted. The USSR put nuclear missiles in Cuba after we put nuclear missiles on their border in Turkey. Okay, so let's, let's, don't get it twisted. But the private assurance is saying that publicly, the USSR will move their missiles out of Cuba in ex simply because the United States is promising not to attack Cuba. And then secretly, quietly, six months later, the United States would remove their nuclear missiles out of Turkey. See, it had to be secretly and quietly because the United States wanted to save face over the fact that Russia simply called their bluff by putting missiles in, put, putting missiles in Cuba. And now Khrushchev agreed to this. And he, he, and he put in his autobiography. Go check it out. He put in his autobiography that it was because he actually trusted Kennedy. He trusted Kennedy. So here, the reason why we didn't go to nuclear war is the premier of the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War trusted the president of the United States when he gave him the private assurance. So now let's fast forward to the private assurance that, 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 that the Clinton administration and H.W. Bush gave to, to, to Gorbachev and Yeltsin. I'm going to just take a quote out of the interview with Putin and Tucker Carlson, Putin said, America tricked us. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because when we gave, we gave Gorbachev and, and, and Yeltsin the private assurance that we would not move one inch east of Germany, there was a history to that. That wasn't just, you know, oh, we, we don't need to write that down. These countries... Countries engage in private assurances to solve very difficult problems all the damn time because in order to reach an agreement, someone usually has to save face, okay? <laughs> so it was a normal thing of that significance to use a private assurance, <laughs> okay? okay? Right? So the former leaders of the Soviet Union had every reason to trust. When the American president said, given the history, right, that, yes, I will not. I give you a private assurance. I will not move one inch east of Germany. NATO would not move one inch, one inch east of Germany. They had every reason to believe that because we did it to solve the Cuban Missile Crisis in a much more tense situation. We, that, that, no one was standing down then, and we, and we used it to solve the problem. So that's how we tricked them. Because what did we do? We moved NATO and absorbed the entire Warsaw Pact, essentially. All the, the, the security buffer countries that the former USSR used during the Cold War to insulate them from Western aggression, Western forces right, in, the, in Europe, NATO moved and absorbed all of them. Progressively. Almost all. And <laughs> while they did it, most of this time Putin was in office and he complained bitterly at the United Nations to say, you promised you wouldn't do this and you did it anyway and you continue to do it. By the time the subject came up that, they, that we were going to, we were going to, even absorb Ukraine into NATO, right? Russia was really clear that this was their red line. This they would not stand for. They stood for the other 13 countries or so that we, that we absorbed that we promised we wouldn't do, <laughs> right? But now Ukraine is on their damn border, <laughs> okay? So let me ask you a serious question. <laughs> just, just, you know, can, can we be real? If China and Russia 
signed a nuclear defense treaty with Mexico. And they endeavored to put intercontinental ballistic missiles in Mexico on the American border. Okay? Would you consider it, would you consider it that America would be the aggressor when they rolled over Mexico for even thinking about such a thing? No, right? So can we come back to reality? Because guess what? Every aspect of the Ukraine story that we've been told, important aspect, is a lie. This wasn't the Ukrainian populace exercising their sovereignty, saying, you know what? As an independent nation, I want to join NATO. No. Okay, that would be one thing. But it wasn't. It's a matter of public record. No, it's not a matter of, but it's, it's, it's discoverable through the public record, through the internet, that the United States in, involved itself in financing the violent overthrow of the democratically elected government of the Ukraine in 2014. Now, the government of Ukraine leading up to that point was committed to neutrality when it came to NATO. It was a part of their constitution, right? But we engaged in subterfuge and we financed, participated in the financing of the violent overthrow of the government in Ukraine in 2014. An interesting tidbit of proof, because you hardly get proof of these things, was that Victoria Newland, Assistant National Security Advisor, I mean, Darth Vader, literally was caught on tape before the overthrow of the government in Ukraine, naming who would be the new government of Ukraine. <laughs> You can't make this shit up. <laughs> okay, okay. So, okay, so there we go. The United States overthrows the government, uh, participates in the overthrow of, of a government that was neutral to joining NATO and installs a government that is intent to join NATO. That government then proceeds to go, into, go on an internal war against ethnically Russian Ukrainians in Donbass, killing upwards of 15,000 of them using military-grade weaponry, at which point this is where Russia steps in back then to defend them. <laughs> okay, okay, can we understand each other? And so they, then they engage in a treaty, in an agreement called the Minsk Ag Agreements, which settled the issue, which... which, which on how they were going to deal with those territories in southeastern Ukraine. And this government that we installed decided, oh, and by the way, the signatures to this agreement are Germany, France, Russia, you know, it wasn't just Ukraine, okay. They were, they were guarantors, European guarantors, okay. And the president of Ukraine decides, oh no, we're not doing that. <laughs> We're not doing that. We're going to continue to engage in the ethnic cleansing of ethnically Russian <laughs> Ukrainians, right? Oh, okay. So this is when Russia then, okay, and during that period of time, the United States starts arming the Ukrainians, starts training the Ukrainians, starts building, bu building bases in Ukraine. Can we understand each other? Okay. This is why Russia went to war against Ukraine. Okay. But let us, let us again, be clear. Okay. Before they crossed into Ukraine with their main army, okay, they, they put an agreement on the table with the United States and the West over the Ukraine, the Ukraine question. They wanted a peaceful settlement. And the United States responded to them by saying, NATO expansion is no business of yours, even if it's expanding to your border. Okay, so 
Though them's the facts. Go check it out. Okay, that's the other side of the story. If you know nothing else, where is Ukraine? How is it possible that Ukraine is not in the security buffer of this of Russia? How is it possible that it's not their business whether Ukraine joins NATO? How is it possible if the way Ukraine joins NATO is the United States participates in overthrowing the government in Ukraine that was neutral, committed to neutrality, in order to install a government intent on joining NATO? How is that that in their interest? How would we respond <laughs> if this was in Mexico or in Canada, right? Would we be really concerned about the sovereignty of Mexico or Canada? Were we concerned about the sovereignty of Cuba? They were a sovereign country. Why can't they sign nuclear defense treaties with whomever they want, right? <laughs> okay, so can we get back and have a shred of integrity aligned with our own American history, <laughs> okay, right? This is what happened in Ukraine. But what have we been told? A bullshit narrative from one point of view, completely vilifying the other side. Now, let's also not get it twisted. In no way am I suggesting that Putin is an angel. I mean, we know he's murdered dissidents around, you know, in the UK and other places. No, all these world leaders have, uh, have seemed to have a sociopathic streak in them. <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean facts are facts. Doesn't mean truth is not truth. <laughs> right? No one is irredeemable. No one is just evil. No one, when is life, when is any person only bad, has nothing to offer, has no, 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 no vehicle to truth will come through them? No, that's never the case. Okay. And it's certainly not the case for Putin. Just like it's not the case for, for Biden. Just like it's not the case for Trump. Just like it's not the case for me or you. Okay. So the point of this, and I'm going to wrap it up, is that the narratives the explanations that we're given by the main media, the primary media, the establishment media, is one-sided on purpose, not to inform us of the truth, but to induce us to do what, um, what Chomsky talked about, to manufacture our consent. And the only thing we can do to reclaim any control over our lives is set it aside and do what we can to find out the facts as best we can. And if you do that, you will see you've been lied to. You've been conned. So what does this have to do with Patrick Lovell and the truth bombs. It has to do with why, why you need to watch Patrick Lovell's five-part documentary, The Con. You can access this documentary, which was professionally done, at www.thecon.tv. It will tell you the facts behind the bullshit narrative that we were told that led to the financial crash of 2008, 2009, and how everyone got away with it. Now, I know a lot of you suspect that's true, but I can tell you, I, I'm a 25-year banker, and I didn't know why it was true. You need to know why it was true. So take the time. Recognize that we're being lied to. But it's not just any kind of lie. It's a con. Those lies are told to us to get us to do things that don't serve us, that serve the wealthy elites. And we need to break away from that. And realize that all of us have been lied to. The con will help you. 
And once you find out the truth, then we move to what we should do. And what we should do is unite. America is still a democratic republic. More Americans want and are independent than are either Republican or Democratic. By far. We need to elect a person, an independent, for president of the United States this year that represents us. We can do that, but we need a unifying, we need a unifying program. And that, and that program is really simple. And I'm throwing it out here. It's called the Clean New Deal. The primary, the, the, it's just a two-step program. The first step is a new commitment by the United States to invest our extraordinary resources into rebuilding the American middle class. A modern version of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. And it has details as to how we can do that. So but a commitment by the United States of America to reinvest in its people, to rebuild the American middle class, because that is who's been conned. Over the, over the last 50 years. The middle class and the working class have been robbed over the last 50 years by the wealthy elites. And it's time for us to take that back. The second part, which is equally as important, if not more important, is to hold accountable the wealthy elites who robbed us, who conned us, to bring them to justice. If we elect a president who's not owned by the wealthy elites on the basis of the Clean New Deal, that president can select, can appoint independent counsel to investigate all actors who engaged in criminal activity that, that caused the multi-trillion dollar transfer of wealth from working and middle-class people to the top 1%. Patrick speaks to the numbers. There's two numbers, $50 trillion between 1975 and, 20, and, and, and today, in 2020, and $70 trillion out of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve between the Great Financial Crash, I mean, I mean the Great Recession, through through um, the, the CARES Act to today. Two different sources of highway robbery conducted by wealth, by extreme wealth in this country. We need to hold them to account. And a president can do it by appointing independent counsel. So thank you for your time today. This is Patrick Lovell's truth bomb. When you have the facts, you're bulletproof. This is the thing we're calling you together to join us so that we can reclaim our sovereignty. Thank you, and you all take care.